Good evening and welcome to the opening weekend of our series, Liberating Hollywood, Women Directors and 1970s American Cinema. Tonight we have a spectacular double feature, Bury Me an Angel and Summer School Teachers, both written and directed by Barbara Peters, who is here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Barbara, from coming down from the paradise of Oregon to the big city. So we're going to do a Q&A um, after Bury Me an Angel, so please stick around for that. <clears throat> this, series, um, this series showcases the wide variety of films made during the 1970s. And we really wanted to be able to present to audiences today the variety of movies that folks were making, and specifically women directors in the 1970s, the variety of films that they were making during that decade. And so with tonight's films, these movies are excellent examples of low-budget, independent movies that now we describe as exploitation films. Um, and these films, although they were made within the production culture of exploitation, they were made cheaply, they were made quickly, um, they showed to a variety of exhibition spaces, uh, theaters, as well as drive-ins, and they targeted a, a young youth audience. These two movies are also so distinct. They work in genre. Uh, Bury Me an Angel is a biker film. Summer school teachers invented a genre, the teacher genre. <laughs> Which, and the nurse genre, and these were real genres because they were franchises in the 70s. Um, and because of the quick and cheap nature of exploitation films in the 70s, filmmakers really had to be inventive. They had small resources and, and a lot of demands for um, outcome and production. And so that's something that we are really going to enjoy tonight in these two Barbara Peters films. The way in which Barbara, with um, not a lot of time and money, produced two films that are really spectacular in different and um, enjoyable ways. So enjoy Bury Me an Angel and Summer School Teachers and our Q&A in between with Ms. Barbara Peters, who's going to tell us some secrets of the trade. Some. No. Maybe, no? All right. Maybe. One. All right. Enjoy. Let's start with the opening scene. Opening in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> so, where tell us about the location and tell us about how you stage that. What what exactly were you trying to capture in the opening of this film with that scene? <laughs> the uh, I shot the whole first part of the movie and the house and everything was in my own house that I was renting at the time. Uh, about a half a block from CBS Studios <laughs> in <laughs> Studio City. And uh, we almost got kicked out because the bedroom scene with the kid at the window, mm -hmm. uh, that was about 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the neighbors complained. And when the landlady came over, there was Dixie naked in the window. And it was like, <laughs> you guys are out of here. So, But uh, it was a free location, so that's why we used it. Um, that was our garage, and the bike that they were tearing apart was my bike. <laughs> and uh, most of the kids were in a band, and the rest of them were actual bikers, because I had just finished a couple of uh, working on a couple of bike movies, and so I had a couple of the Gallopin' Gooses and the Satan Slaves that came to work on it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. <laughs> When you're 28 years old, that's exciting. <laughs> I like the um, the knife with the drugs. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that wasn't really drugs. 
<laughs> that was my next That's question. That's the disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, that was the day. That was what was going on. And I tell you, I feel bad because up above that garage, there was an apartment. And a nice young couple with a new baby were living up there. And uh, of course, you know, we were shooting that at night because that's when you shoot, when you have no permits. And uh, we invited them down, but they didn't want to come. I don't know. <laughs> Why? It looked like a pretty great party. <laughs> yeah, it was. And uh, Dixie's brother in it, or Gag's brother in it, was actually her brother. And his name was actually Dennis. And he actually got murdered about six months after the movie. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know? Imitation of life, huh? Yeah. So uh, how did you come to make this film? You said you were had been working on some biker films previously. Well, yeah. Um, Dick Compton, uh, God bless him, he uh, was in the, uh, the bar fight. Mm -hmm. he, he was making a movie before me. Uh, called Angels Die Hard. And it was, there was a whole period in the f late 50s and the 60s when motorcycle movies, believe it or not, were very popular. And uh, it was the drive-in fare. You had to have certain elements for the drive-in circuit. And one of them was that no movie go over 90 minutes because you wanted to get two in there. And you wanted a nice big break in the middle so everybody could go up and get their popcorn and their hot dogs and stuff. So th there was a criteria, but it was a great place to dip your toes in the water. They don't have that anymore except for kids and their, their, vi their, their video cameras and the digital world. But this was before there was any of that. Uh, like the, <laughs> the dream sequence, which we shot in the garage. Everything got <laughs> shot in the garage. <laughs> and uh, we just strung up a bunch of toys and ran it through and put a little grease on the lens. And, you know, these are the things you did before you had all the templates that uh, Final Corp Pro gives you. Uh, when you decided to make a dissolve, you, you measured it very carefully and you marked it China marker and you taped it together and you sent it to the lab and three days later they got it back to you and then you took a look at it and went, ooh, that's a little too short. I think we need to, today you just uh, throw it into Final Cut and zip, zip and go, oh, stretch and there it is. So it was a whole different world in those days. How did you cast Dixie Peabody? Oh, that was easy. She was gorgeous. She was six foot tall. And she was a biker. And she was one of the extras on Dick's movie that I was script supervising for $25 a day. And um, I just thought she was stunning. And he had some backers that came to his set. And he said, Barbara, you ought to talk to them. You ought to talk to them. I'll introduce you. And I said, well, let's just talk to them. And we got talking, they said, oh, well, I understand you have an idea for a movie. And I'm looking at Dick going, <laughs> and he goes. So I said, uh, yeah, I do, uh-huh. And they asked me about it, and I stood there for about 30 seconds, and my mind just exploded, and I said, yeah, uh, it's about a six-foot woman who's a biker. And she has a brother. And then it just went blah, 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 blah. And uh, they said, oh, I'd love to read the script. Do you have it with you? And I said, well, I'm working on it. Uh, but I can give it to you tomorrow. And this was already at 6 o'clock in the evening. I gave them a script the next day, people. <laughs> yes, I did. I was hungry. And they gave me $90,000 to make a movie. Here's the best part that got me to my next movie, is I made it for 60000 <laughs> And I was so naive, I gave the investors back $30,000. <laughs> How dumb can you be? <laughs> but I got my first movie made. <laughs> this was actually your was second important. film, though. Right, because um, well, between had, the two. I had gone in and fixed other people's stuff and uh, did some remake things. Uh, 
but it was like my first real one that was mm -hmm. mine. I wrote it, I directed mm -hmm. it, I cast it. I got the money for it. Mm -hmm. And then I got a distribution contract from Roger Corman, mm -hmm. and that was the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. Long eight years. <laughs> How did you film the, uh, the motorcycle scenes? On a camera. <laughs> <laughs> did you have like a complicated rig? On your no, <laughs> we didn't have money for complicated rigs. I saved where I could and got a half a day f with a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And then we brought the helicopter. Sven Wilhelm was the uh, DP. And he confessed that he was terrified of heights. And he, there was no way he wanted to hang out of the, on the Tyler Mount. You got to do what a girl's got to do. <laughs> so that's where, and, and we were on the back of a, 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 a camera car, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a Ritter for the, for the blowing scene. But here's the interesting part. I'll tell you how hungry actors can get. Both of those guys had never had their butt on a bicycle before, <laughs> let alone a motorcycle. And uh, they lied to me in casting. And therefore, I sent Dixie out with them, and in one week, they learned to ride enough to make this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what actor will do that today? <laughs> I don't know. You rode motorcycles at this time as well? Yeah. How did, was, you, get, how did you get in, How did you get involved in riding bikes? Well, just being around motorcycles, and they were great fun. And um, Dan Haggerty, by the way, that was his first speaking role. Ever. And uh, I met him in his shop where he was making furniture. And I said, oh my God, this guy's gorgeous. I said, have you ever thought about being in movies? And he said, yeah, I've been in an extra a couple of times. I said, how about being in my movie? He goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> so he was, was really it. that sensitive in real life? Was he? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, he was a great guy, and he was very sweet. He, he was a he was a great guy. This movie really moves between comedy and serious drama. Yeah, how, well, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> how did you how did you plan for that? How did you uh, think about that as you were writing your script and working with your actors? As I told you, I wrote the script overnight. That was an overnight thing, and then once they read it, I took it back and I said, "Well, I need to do a little work on it," and I did take it home. And um, it, it just, there were just too many things that I thought, oh, well, you know, real life is funny. And so it just grew into it. I had the basics, and I knew what was going to happen, and I knew she was going to kill him in the end, or she was going to bury her brother. One of the two, we never know. But um, so, yeah, life, uh, hey, I had very few professional actors in that movie. Uh, the, the guy who played uh, Preacher, mm -hmm. uh, he was an old hippie who was making that furniture out there. That was his home. That's where he lived. Uh, in the, the bar fight, the big curly-headed guy uh, was a writer for LA Times. It was Dick Compton who was a director. Uh, the guy in the red polka dotted hat was one of the investors. Uh, <laughs> the two guys who were sharing the shots, that's what they were doing. Hoss. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was one of the, they were just in the bar when we got there and we said, hey, have you ever been in a movie? Because that's what you did with $60,000. <laughs> have you ever been in a movie? <laughs> and thank God we got quite a few who were willing to do it. Ooh, where'd I get off dirty? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Some Move questions along. from the audience. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody. Yeah, right here in the white shirt. Oh, wait, sorry. Please wait for the microphone. I heard him. Um, yes. Uh, they're dead. Uh, is Tracy, Terry still alive? Are you Terry? No, I'm oh, <laughs> that would have been a hell of a shock. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I know for sure Dixie has passed. I, I, 
Um, Dick Compton has passed. I would say 50% of the uh, people in that movie are now moving on. <laughs> Where is he? What's he doing? Oh, thank, thank God we all are. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else? Back here or in the glasses? Here's a, up here, yeah. Hey, I was just curious about the color in the film, all the red and purple. I think that's the quality of the negative and the, the print that's left. Yeah, this okay. is something that's This is over 50 years old. Right. <laughs> it's something that's going to come up a lot in this series. We talked about it last night that some of the prints are just um, not as pristine yeah. as we'd the like. The fade to black was fade to red on mm -hmm. all of this. So it really is a preservation issue that these films are certainly older and they're classics. And um, the one that we're going to be watching following uh, next is actually a, a new print. So, um, so And it's a comedy yeah. too. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, I'm curious about, there was a lot of her like dealing with trauma and sort of what we would now call like PTSD kind of flashbacks and things like that. And um, I guess I was wondering how you were approaching that at the time, like what you were bringing into that to, you know, did that come up in the writing or... Um, was that part of sort of the original core idea and what you sort of brought into writing that? Okay. Um, PTSD was not a phrase back in that time. Uh, Vietnam vets weren't coming back yet. That was a phrase that we're very casual with today, but it wasn't even used back then. But what we were dealing with was a trauma of a sister losing her brother, and that was the only family she had left. So a lot of it, and, uh, and remember, uh, Dixie was not an actress. She had no training. Uh, so we would just work it out each day, each scene, and how she felt about it, and what she could bring to it. And so I used to deal with her a lot about the suppositions of her brother, if Dennis, something terrible were to happen to Dennis, which six months after the film was over, did, um, how would she deal with it? But it was basically written in the script as, and the script was originally called The Hunt, and it was just supposed to be a, a running adventure of them on the hunt for the fellow who killed their brother. It was. It was to be a drive-in movie that fit all the criteria that would bring in the cash to get me the next film. We weren't digging all that deep. And like I said, it was written overnight. But it took me a week to rewrite it. I think it's great that you wrote it overnight. I think so much of that. In, I, I just love that you said that because you didn't have time to judge yourself. You were just like, and we're making a movie. Oh, and yeah. It's, it's <laughs> in the hotel room on a, on a little Smith Corona that I was write, uh, typing up the, the script notes. For so the, the other script film notes had to wait because I had to work all night. Forgot what my question was. This oh, story sorry. is so amazing. She was talking about PTSD and trauma. Oh, and for me, what really stood out was the scene with the witch, and this truth that was being spoken the about voice. her anger. <laughs> yeah, there was so. I mean, uh, uh, on the line with the PTSD and the trauma, and the. I mean, to have a generation of people watching something that's talking about how to process anger without continual violence speaks very much to the society at the time and when Vietnam was shifting down. And I don't know if that was, I mean, clearly it wasn't intentional, intentional, but I'm curious about the witch character and I'm curious about what she brings to the story. Well, she was, she was sort of the, 
narrator in a sense, talking to the kids, saying, you know, this, it's useless what you're doing. It, it's not going to bring him back. It's not going to make it better. Um, I would say she was the, um, the reason, the reasoning person in the film. But had I made this movie five years later, it probably would have been much different. In what way? Well, there would have been a, a bigger sense about PTSD and all of that. It wasn't an issue at that time of war. It was one person with the loss of her brother. And uh, so it, it, it hadn't expanded to that point yet where it was PTSD was a discussion and we were going and interviewing people in the vet hospitals and that came later. When you, when you wrote the script, um, were the sort of dream sequences always in it or had yes. it? Oh yes, I loved dream sequences. I'm a big <laughs> fan of Fellini and all those <laughs> movies that I skipped uh, college classes to go to the Iowan theater and watch foreign films. <laughs> Knife in the Water, La Strada. Oh yeah, that was my meat, you know. <laughs> So uh, that was my ode to <laughs> the foreign film. <laughs> Back here, way in the last row. I would like to commend you for being bold enough to put issues like PTSD and brother-sister incest in a film, especially in those days, because nobody was talking about those issues. Well, and you couldn't have gotten a, a, a film made uh, in your regular markets. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have bought that film. Right. I worked in a psychiatric hospital in the late 60s, mm -hmm. and it was treated as fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so they started coming home from Vietnam. Yeah. And I also want to say that you really had me in this film very early on when the guy starts coming on to her, I can't remember exactly who it was, some random guy, and she collars him. Little weasel? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna like this film. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. You know, the first screen, thank you very much. The, the first screening I was uh, invited to was the Women's Film Festival in Canada, up in uh, Toronto. And, no. <laughs> Tell the whole story, Barbara. And tell the whole story. The thing was, I was there with some very heavyweight women, uh, Agnes Varda, uh, Shirley Clark, Sh Shirley Clark, and Vida, and, and Viva, and Viva, a and you know they were all, oh Jason, the portrait of Jason, and, pfft, and then they're going to show my movie, and I'm like, oh my god, I could just <laughs> die. And when the movie started, it was, you know. Uh, all these ladies who had come for this intellectual weekend of women's films, and it was like, <gasps> and I thought, this would be a good time to leave. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, when she took off on the motorcycle, boom, they all started applauding, and I went, yeah, we got a movie. <laughs> but I've always dealt with film like that. You know, it's a party. Did you, f considering that this was uh, an exploitation film and there were these expectations of certain amounts of violence and action and sex and nudity. Oh, you had to have those things. So how did you, how did you deal with that in this film? How did you decide what kind of nudity you were going to show? Because considering. Well, she was beautiful. It was mm -hmm. easy. Huh? But, uh, and Dan Haggerty, what a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of meat. Do you like that, girls? <laughs> he was he was a sweetheart, and what a body. And so you don't ever see a lot of uh, very little frontal nudity other than her breasts and in the water. And I must say that was another one of my art shots, was her walking into the, the ice-cold Kern River. And 
what a trooper she was. You could really tell how cold she was. Woo! <laughs> the guys were showing it too. <laughs> yes, right down here. Hi, thank you for coming. I, I had a two-part question about humanoids from the deep. I don't uh, talk about that film. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. Ac actually, getting back I'm to glad this you film, came, then. Though, to see this. <laughs> <laughs> um, there seems to be an undercurrent of Greek mythology. You know, I was thinking of the Odyssey and the Enchantress, and, and I was wondering, were you aware of that when you're making in some of your other films that we're not talking about? But, but uh, were you aware of that when you're making these films, or is that just something that that sort of permeated your work as a filmmaker? Well, I've always since a small little girl been a feminist. And so I, in those years, viewed women much differently than was viewed by men filmmakers. And if that's what you're referring to, that's, yeah. I just didn't see why the hero had to be a guy. <laughs> Let's set up the next film, Summer School Teachers. And our cinematographer is right there, Eric Saarinen. For Summer School Teachers. And Leslie Otis. Annie Hadsall. <laughs> I'm not the only guilty person that ever worked <laughs> for Roger Corman. Uh, and it was meant to be a comedy. It fit into the three girl genre that was what he would have. And so he told me if I could write a three-girl picture, and I'd been there a while, cleaning Working up for, for other Corman. people. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I said, when am I going to get a movie? And he goes, well, write me uh, some uh, three-girl stuff. How about a school teacher? I said, that'll do. <laughs> and I'm from Iowa, so all the girls came from Iowa. They came on the bus, on a Greyhound bus. And um, once again, we shot it all locally. And I noticed in something that you either published or was it that the budget was 750000 Oh, please. Too high, too high. Roger never spent 750000 for those things. He may have publicized he did, mm -hmm. but he didn't. Uh, it was more like about two and a quarter, 250, mm -hmm. And we had 12 days to shoot it. They shoot episodes, 45-minute episodes in television today in 12 days. <laughs> Tell us, what was the interest in the three-girl formula? Like, or sort of explain what he that... He felt that it worked for him. It had the right amount of exploitation. You had three stories, so you didn't have to get too deep on any of them. And you could have three naked girls at some point in the movie, and you had to have some action. It was the same formula and it had worked for him for a very long time. So it was my job to see if I could make one in that, mm -hmm. in that little niche that uh, he laid out. Mm -hmm. All right, well. And we have summer school teachers. <laughs> all right, good, we look forward to that. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Woo.